Merja Balar, Horst Kildinis. Anatolia has always been the land foremost in vine growing and wine production. And myth conceals the truth when it teaches us that at one end of the country, the biblical Noah planted the first vine, and at the other, the mythical Dionysus set out from Phrygia and bestowed his magnificent gifts on the world. It is precisely due to this incomparable mythical movement of vines and wine, in other words, this thousand-year-old tradition which summarizes in an ex exemplary manner all that archaeology and history respectively have handed down, that Asia Minor, Anatolia, emerges as uh, the birthplace of this unique and blessed product of the Eastern Basin of the Mediterranean. Nations came to love the abundant products of the vine and not only the wine. Either they were grapes, must, vinegar, resins, or pecmes, or preparations based on these. And simply put, wine must always be treated as a blessed product, and thus was it seen by all the people of this particular place, pagan Greens and uh, Romans, Christians, Jews, and even Muslims, as uh, the red juice of the grape brought to mind human blood, life itself. It was extolled by the ancients and the Byzantines, adored by emperors and the sultans, exalted by the Persian of Omar Khayyam. Ottoman gazelle praised the Jami Sharapi Hosh Gvar, that is, the cup of the pleasant wine. In Ottoman lyric poetry, the wine cup, jam, is traditionally compared to this legendary cup of jam seared, jammy jam. The crystal globe in which one could see all that came to pass in the world, past, present, and future, observes Walter Andrews. Part of this history aspects of this culture will be presented by our two speakers today. Lucien Tis Senojak was born am amidst the vineyards. She is the daughter of a wine producer from California. In Turkey, alongside her academic pursuits, she and her family have worked hard to create a wonderful, beautiful vinegar in Assos. Her love and knowledge of vines and wine therefore go without saying. She understands the vine, is familiar with the wine-making techniques, and knows its history and culture. In 2011, she organized at Koch University, the first conference on the history of wine in Turkey, entitled Of Vines and Wines, the production and consumption of wine in Anatolian civilization through the ages. Ilias Anagnostakis and I were inv invited to participate as uh, members of the team in Onistoro, History of Wine, a team of historians and enologists who from 2000 to 2008 organized workshops in Greece on the history of its wine. Lucien and I worked uh, 
brilliantly together. And I want to believe that we shall continue to organize academic meetings on the, on the wine culture of the Eastern Mediterranean, on the study of the viticulture and wine production on both sides of the Aegean. Greece and Turkey can work together in this field. We have the ability, and it is certainly worth a try. Her lecture today combines interdisciplinary tools and findings from cooperation between historians, umbelographers, enologists. She will present the cultural landscape and cultural roots in Turkey by calling on a result of the recent research in archaeology and genetics which corroborate the great tradition of wine in Anatolia. Our second guest is Fikret Yilmaz, a social and economic historian, a trusted colleague and good friend. We have spent many long summers toiling in the Ottoman archives together, as well as plenty of evenings with friends and colleagues in Meihane in the old tunnel or at Cicek Passage. He will speak to us about wine consumption in the Ottoman Empire, about the taverns, the laws governing their operation, their location, their customers, the, the Christian and Muslim patrons referred to by Ottoman documents and travelers who described the taverns near the harbors outside the walls of the Ottoman cities. Those disreputable places, writes Evliyacelebi, kept by infidels. And there were more than 1,060 uh, 1, in the capital of the empire, spread around Psomathia, Samatia, Kumkapu, Chimbali, Fanar, Haskoi, and elsewhere. When you say Galata, Evliya points out, it is like saying tavernas. Fikret Yilmaz is one of the few Turks researchers that have studied wine in the Ottoman Empire. And I am not referring to those studies that have researched it in the light of the Islamic theology or philology, which are numerous. numerous. Admittedly, there was no interest in studying viticulture or the marketing of its products in Ottoman times and the history of other alcoholic drinks, boza, raku, that wonderful Arslan city. Has, of course, never been researched. The presence of wine and how it was received by the society of the era have most certainly never been studied either. Fikret Gilmaz will today speak to us about how wine was accepted in the 16th and 17th centuries. Ladies and gentlemen, dear symposiums, welcome to this mini symposium in the Sismanoglio Megaro. I think it's on, is it? Is it? Did I turn it off? Yes. 
Okay. I think I have to get it a little closer. Okay. Um, well, thank you. I'd first like to thank Dr. Evangelia Balta and the Sismanolu Megaro Foundation, as well as the Greek Consulate for sponsoring this group of talks on food, spirits, and gastronomic traditions. It's a ple pleasure also for me to be here this evening with all of you and with Dr. Fikret Yilmaz and Dr. Balta, um, especially because they are two of the 12 authors in the forthcoming volume that Dr. Balta mentioned, um, the, uh, of wines, uh, Vines and Wines, the Production and Consumption of Wine in Anatolian Civilizations Through the Ages. I'm, um, this is a volume I'm editing about the history of vita and viniculture in Anatolia, which will appear next year um, in 2015. My talk this evening focuses um, on the subject of heritage of grape growing and winemaking in Turkey, um, rather than the history of these two subjects. Um, so first let me explain briefly how I'm making this distinction between heritage and history, as the purposes of the two fields at times do diverge. While practitioners of both history and heritage recognize that the meanings and representations of an event or site are constructed, and no interpretation can be considered as absolute or static, it's more the applied nature of heritage studies as Peter Howard and others have pointed out, that has tended to differentiate the older discipline of history from its postmodern and often more practically oriented offspring. So this school of heritage suggests that history, I quote, is interested in the past, heritage is interested in how the past might be conserved and interpreted for the benefit of the present and the future, unquote. Therefore, the most recent theories of heritage focus more on the present than the past and examine how people relate, define, and reject aspects of their heritage. Heritage becomes a way of knowing and seeing an aspect of social practice. But all would agree that what constitutes heritage at any particular time is profoundly political and can be utilized by different interest groups and individuals for different purposes and with varying degrees of hegemony and le legitimacy. Winemakers and wine lobbyists are no strangers to using the concept of heritage as part of a marketing, political, or legal strategy. A recently published volume called Wine and Identity, Branding, Heritage, and Terroir examines just that how concepts which are fluid and hard to define, concepts such as um, heritage and terroir, can be very easily manipulated and packaged into a variety of heritage narratives to promote a product or pass a law. As an example of this, wine lobbyists in Europe have learned the value of using the concept of heritage for legislative action in resisting the increasing restrictions which were brought initially in 1991 by the Loi Evin, the Evin Law. In France is a piece of legislation which restricts the advertisement of tobacco and alcohol. And some of these um, will look familiar to those of you who have seen this on Turkish wine bottles. Uh, this past summer, a group of senators was able to convince the French Parliament to lessen some of the proposed advertising restrictions in the country by claiming that wine was an essential part of the country's heritage, part of the French patrimony. As Senator Roland Courteau proclaimed, the restrictions posed by the Loi Evin were a threat to France and its 2,000-year-old wine heritage. Europe's two millennium legacy of wine production pales in comparison to the evidence that archaeologists and archaeobotanists have found for early winemaking in southeastern Anatolia, Iran, and the Caucasus. Evidence of winemaking in this fertile triangle, the birthplace of several other early crops, and the domestication of the vitis vinifera, the Eurasian grapevine, 
from which most wine is made today, dates back several millennia to the Neolithic era, um, around 8,500 BC. But I promised tonight I would talk of heritage and not history. So uh, heritage defined by UNESCO, quote, is our legacy from the past which we live with today and what we pass on to future generations. So this evening I'm going to concentrate on how the important legacy of wine in this part of the world, a legacy which dates to the Neolithic era, and which includes both tangible and intangible aspects of heritage, can be better protected, passed on to those future generations, by using two specific heritage instruments, the cultural landscape and the cultural route. I'll conclude this talk tonight with some remarks about how both ampelography, which is the identification and classification of grape varieties based on their morphology, coupled with new research in genetic fingerprinting and DNA studies to determine the lineage of grapes, their parents and ancestors, is helping to raise awareness about the threat, what is seen to the autochthonous, the native uh, grape varieties, and how this interest in maintaining the authenticity of the native varieties of wine found in the region that constitutes Turkey today challenges some of the ideas promoted in postmodern heritage studies, uh, which argue actually against drawing cultural lines along national borders. Among the international organizations that exist to research and promote the heritage of wine, UNESCO's World Heritage Organization has been among the most important institutions in raising public awareness about how winemaking, viticultural practices can be conceptualized and conserved as cultural heritage. Today, 24 of the 1,007 sites on the World Heritage List include historical vineyards and or winemaking facilities. And 12 of these were specifically inscribed or selected to be on the World Heritage List because of the importance of either their vineyard landscapes, evidence of historic winemaking practices, or architectural remains of places where wine has been made or stored for centuries, such as cellars or wineries. The majority of these 12 uh, 24 World Heritage Vineyard landscapes uh, were selected because of their universal category, let me just go back, excuse me, to cultural, uh, as cultural landscapes, which is a relatively new heritage category used to inscribe World Heritage sites since 1992. So defined here in the slide um, by UNESCO, a cultural landscape is a site where human interaction with natural systems has over a long period of time formed a distinctive landscape. And the interactions arise from and cause cultural values to develop. Some examples of other cultural heritage landscapes which have been shaped by agricultural practices, just to give you a few, there are, uh, as I said, quite, quite a lot of cultural landscapes these days, but the coffee plantations of Colombia are one. Uh, there is not Raku, but the agave fields for tequila production in Mexico is another. So you can see how vineyards fit very nicely into this category of cultural landscapes, as they are landscapes which are very much shaped by man, and I would also say women as well. A turning point in the recognition of vineyards as cultural landscapes and heritage was the UNESCO meeting that was held in Tokai, Hungary in 2001, which did outline that vineyard cultures are the result of human work and the interaction between people and their environment. And vineyards are often located in areas with a long human presence and illustrate this exchange between different cultural traditions. In Turkey, um, the World Heritage Site of Göreme National Park and the rock sites of Cappadocia is an example of a cultural landscape due to the unique landscape features of the Göreme National Park and the rock dwellings of Cappadocia. But unfortunately, there is no men mention in the main World Heritage description for Cappadocia of the vineyards and winemaking practices, 
which have been a part of the agricultural composition of this region, certainly since the early Christian era, and quite possibly long before that to the Hittites. And this is a point I'll return to in a moment. But very quickly, just to give you an idea, the 12 vineyards which have been inscribed from 1997 to 2014 on the World Heritage List uh, for uh, being vineyards um, are here with their inscription dates. So I'll run through these very quickly. Um, in France, a second one in France, Austria, Portugal, Hungary, Germany, Portugal, Italy, Switzerland, I feel like the Euro, Euro song competition, um, and the Piedmont wine region in Italy, and an interesting one that was just inscribed, which is the land of the olives and wines, which is the cultural landscape of southern Jerusalem. And this was interestingly submitted by Palestine as an emergency nomination under threat in 2014 and went on the list right away. Uh, to date, all the sites that have been listed by the World Heritage Organization for some aspect of their viticultural heritage are in Europe, ap um, apart from the recently inscribed 2014 landscape in uh, Palestine. But the Eurocentricity of these vineyard inscriptions will no doubt change as new actors in the wine industry, Thailand, India, China, the latter now among the world's fifth largest producer of wine, um, begin to take over larger shares of the wine market and develop vineyards in areas such as the Helan mountain range near the Yellow River. So whether these new Asian vineyards will be able to be classified as heritage landscapes based on their grapevine vineyards and wine production is debatable. I don't know about the um, cute look wine uh, here shown with the panda, but, uh, but these vineyards certainly qualify as new examples of cultural landscape. On the World Heritage Organization's tentative list, or those sites for which applications have already been submitted to the World Heritage Organization and whose files are under consideration for inscription to the permanent list, there's now 13 sites which have some type of viticultural heritage as part of their inscription criteria. So the tentative list for vineyard heritage sites, like the inscribed list, continues to show European dominance but there is a wider geographical reach into Eastern Europe and to regions outside of Europe, South Africa, Argentina, and Colombia. And you can see in chronicle, chronological order of their acceptance, this slide here shows um, which vineyard sites are still waiting to be considered for inscription, uh, full listing on the list. Uh, so what are the benefits of linking heritage instruments such as cultural landscapes with vineyards? Well, for European vineyards, there have been several advantages. Um, since that conference in Hungary, um, an EU-funded organization of World Heritage Vineyards called VITOR was formed in 2007. And you can see here's um, I mean, some of the work that they've been doing, producing publications such as European Guidelines for wine cultural landscape preservation and enhancement. And this points to the importance of vineyard regions throughout Europe sharing different strategies for protection and conservation. The group works to devise solutions to the challenges of managing vineyard landscapes um, that are designated as World Heritage Sites, uh, emphasizing the improvement of biodiversity in the vineyard using integrated pest management approaches to mitigating threats of erosion, climate change, um, and the threats of increasing tourism pressure, as well as problems of seasonal and migration, uh, migrant and seasonal labor. So beyond the tourism benefits, there's much support to be gained by vineyard owners and managers in the cultural landscape heritage structure. In terms of bringing together heritage and cultural landscapes of vineyards, Turkey really hasn't realized its potential. And unfortunately, many of the existing and tentative world heritage sites in Turkey have, um, have again, not explored this potential as an important component of the cultural practices of the site or the agricultural landscape surrounding the site. As mentioned earlier, um, 
the Gurume National Park and rock sites of Cappadocia was inscribed on the World Heritage List in 1985 and became a World Heritage Site prior to the industry's use of cultural landscapes. But an opportunity did arise in 2013 for Turkey to rewrite the site's mission statement. Um, but again, the region's viticultural heritage was not adequ adequately highlighted in the new main statement of outstanding universal value. And in the main 2013 description, there's mention of the agricultural landscape of Cappadocia only as, and I quote, the surrounding la landscape is agricultural with a number of small scattered villages. Yet we know there's evidence for continuous viticulture and wine production in the region as early as the Hittite era up to 1923 in the population exchange between Greece and Turkey and again since the um, establishment of the Turkish Republic. Particularly during the um, Byzantine Empire, ample wine was produced in the monasteries of Cappadocia and in many of the homes and was a widespread tra tradition which continued into the 20th century. As Dr. Balta has noted in her research of both the physical landscape of the region, the Ottoman archival records and the oral testimony from Greek vineyard owners who left Turkey during the population exchange, and I quote, almost all of the houses in Cappadocia had winemaking installations, some in the house and others in the outbuildings around it. So wine production and consumption in Cappadocia was a continuous and intrinsic part of the built heritage and the ritual practices and daily life, the intangible heritage of this region, as well as tangible for several millennia. The enthusiasm for local Cappadocian wine continues to fuel the tourism in the region today, as is evident from the introduction of wine courses at various boutique hotels, specialized wine tours that operate in the region, as well as attempts to establish wine routes in the area, some by Murat Yanku, who's sitting here in the audience tonight with us. The most recently inscribed World Heritage Site in Turkey this past summer, 2014, was the city of Bursa and uh, Jumalı Kızık. Uh, but again, in the extensive heritage nomination files, nothing's mentioned about the viticulturally rich past of the surrounding hinterland. Although we do know from scholars such as um, Anag Anag Anagnostakis, uh, whose map I'm borrowing here for the evening, uh, that, d quote, during the Middle Byzantine period, the regions around the Bithynian lakes and around the cities of Bursa and Nicaea are described as covered with vines, trained up trees. And later in the Ottoman period, which we'll hear about more uh, from Fikrepe, but uh, Halenko has shown in a close reading of Jih the Jihannuma, written by the chronicler Neshri, how much the consumption of wine was a part of the rituals, feast, and celebrations of early sultans like Bayazid, who frequently returned to the capital of Bursa after his victorious campaigns of 1393 and 1394, and appropriate, uh, appropriately for the occasion, celebrated his royal fortune with wine banquets. Wine continued to be an important part of the Bursa economy into the late 19th century, and as Etem Aldem has discovered, even in the highlands of Bursa, there was a production of delicate white and rosé wines on Mount Olympus. As efforts to list more world heritage sites in Turkey accelerate, particularly those with the rich viticultural and vinicultural past, such as Mardin, which has been on Turkey's tentative list since 2000, it's important to recognize how this the wine heritage of the city and its en environs, it's important to recognize that and ensure that it is integrated into the World Heritage nomination files as it is part of the outstanding universal heritage value of Marden, precisely because of the viticultural heritage here that dates to the Neolithic period, continues through the Neo-Assyrian and the Ottoman eras. And with the local Suryani community in Marden, there's a continuing but threatened living heritage of both grape growing and wine production, which is vital to preserve so that it does not disappear. To date, the heritage industry in Turkey has not used the potential of our region's rich viticultural past to define cultural landscapes or nominate heritage sites 
or intangible heritage practices related to winemaking uh, to the World Heritage List. And particularly when we consider the many examples of World Heritage sites in Europe which have highlighted viticulture as an intrinsic part of their heritage, as, as a vital component of the inscription, Turkey and the increasingly threatened heritage of wine protection, uh, production in Turkey could certainly benefit from using more effectively this instrument of cultural landscapes to draw attention to and to promote the rich past of this region's uh, vita, vita and vinicultural heritage. Um, cultural roots, I wanted to talk about briefly, in addition to the concept of cultural landscapes, a second heritage instrument, uh, the cultural root, is also being used to preserve and promote both the tangible and intangible heritage associated with grape growing and wine production around the world. The program of the cultural roots of the Council of Europe emerged in the 1980s as a way to connect European countries through cultural ties rather than purely economic relations. And initially the roots were based on the medieval pilgrimage pathways through Europe, but more recently culinary roots highlighting wine and olive oil production have been particularly successful. The Itervitas, the ways of the vine in Europe, is one among several cultural roots in Europe that was added to the list of approved and economically subsidized cultural roots in May of 2009. Its purpose is to promote the safeguarding, you can see here in the slide, uh, safeguarding and development of the landscape linked to wine production. Um, and there are a variety of other goals of the route, um, but basically it's meant to open up new dialogues between different regions of Europe as well as countries outside of Europe. Um, as of 2014, the countries that are listed though in the Itervites group um, here you can see uh, Turkey is unfortunately not part of that uh, group, but although geographically, historically, it's an essential link, um, it, it should be in the route. So in addition to the, this EU initiative, there are several other wine-related routes in countries neighboring Turkey, some which would make sense certainly for Turkey and its winemakers and policymakers to collaborate with, and this is happening. Um, this, of course, to the north of us, the Wine Producers Association of the Northern Greek Vineyard was an early trade and cultural nonprofit established in 1993 with 15 members, and it's now more than doubled that number with 37 members promoting 41 wineries just in northern Greece. Georgia, which frequently challenges Turkey as the birthplace of wine, is also moving rapidly to exploit its potential as wine, a wine tourism destination promoting itself and its wine route as the oldest wine producing region of Europe, along with its intangible heritage of the fascinating ancient Georgian traditional uh, Quaveri winemaking method, which made it to the UNESCO intangible heritage list just last year. Turkey has been relatively a newcomer to the heritage instrument of cultural routes the Cultural Route Society in Turkey was established two years ago in 2012, but now boasts 17 routes, it's growing quickly, uh, with the famed uh, Lycian Way initiating that in 1999. Um, now, uh, a recent addition to these routes, uh, the Kuzul Ormak Basin Chorum Gastronomy and Walking Route, is dedicated to exploring the gastronomy of this central region of Turkey. And beans, lentils, wheat, poppy seed, noodles, stuffed vegetables, and halva are all part of the gastronomic route that's offered along this culinary route. Um, but wine, uh, to my knowledge, is not highlighted in this route or in actually any of the others, although we know how important, say, for the Hittites, the um, the royal vineyards, protecting their royal vineyards was so important. So certainly there's, um, there are greater challenges today in the present political climate in obtaining official central government approval and financial support of the Turkish cultural roots and cultural landscapes which promote wine production and wine tourism. But there are several private in, uh, initiatives which are being undertaken to create wine roots in Turkey 
Wines of Turkey is one of the most active in this respect with its promotional international literature and activities about the history and current Turkish wine market. And they have proposed a number of wine routes for the country, as you can see here. A part of one of these routes has received some support from local government and has formed in Tekirda. And this is the Thres wine route, the vine route, Tekirda Barotese. It emerged with the financial backing from the Kalkama Bakanle, uh, the Min Ministry of Development and the Thres Tourism Agency, as well as 12 boutique wineries in the region. So the Thrace wine route stretches from Çatalca, just outside Istanbul, to the Gallipoli Peninsula. And the new cultural route of the vine is serving as a way for those smaller wineries which are facing advertising and other restrictions on wine they produce to promote their wines grown in Turkey and the cultural heritage of the surrounding region. So to conclude, after looking at these two heritage instruments of the cultural landscape and the cultural route, and the potential that both have to promote and preserve the heritage of vita and viniculture in Turkey. I wanted to conclude this evening's talk with a few remarks about wine and another heritage concept, that of authenticity. The term authenticity first appears in an international conservation-related document in the Venice Charter in 1964. Heritage in general is valued more dearly if it's seen as authentic, as the real thing. In the case of a building or an object, that means that we don't value a reconstruction or a reproduction as much as we do the actual thing. And there's a higher value placed on the original, on its pure form. In the case of natural heritage, the condition of authenticity and integrity would refer to an organic or functional whole. But what does this mean for grapes and wines produced in Turkey? Several of Turkey's wineries have now won prestigious international awards for their Cabernets, Merlots, and Chardonnays, as well as wines from native varieties such as Kalicik Karasa or Boazkere. Many of the masters of wine, these iconic figures such as Janis Robertson and others, are encouraging winemakers here to focus more on the native varietals, the grape varieties that are seen as belonging to Turkey. But which varieties can we really label as authentic and native to this region when we consider that the heritage reaches back to Neolithic times? This has a large impact on how Turkish vines are, uh, wines are advertised and their ancient parentage is promoted. Will we be as surprised as the Californians were to discover that their native Zinfandel and the Italian uh, Primotivo was actually a descendant of the Croatian Tribida? According to its promotional literature, the organization Wines of Turkey estimates that there are between 1,200 and 1,500 named grape varieties in Turkey, and 600 to 800 of those are genetically different from one another. However, research coming out of the Gen G06 project, a European-wide research consortium whose goal is the characterization of the grapevine genotype, lists only 78 varieties of grapes being of Turkish origin in the Vitis International Variety Catalog. And in the uh, 2012 publication, Wine Grapes, a complete guide to 1,368 wine varieties, including their origins and flavors, of whom one, is the, one of the contributors is Janice Robertson, Turkey is shown with only 26 native varieties out of a total of 1,368 species of securely genetically mapped vitis vinifera vines. So most of these, um, these are the 26 native um, varieties that are allegedly securely mapped genetically as unique to this region. But most of these Turkish vines are stored and protected in the grape germplasm repository at the Institute of Viticulture in Tekirda, which has also published recently their research on grapevine genetic resources of Turkey. The reduced number of Turkish varieties can be explained to some extent by the fact that there are several synonyms for the grape, the same grape. So Kalicik karisa for a, a, an example, is commonly misidentified as Adakarese, Chalk, 
çal karısı, Hasan dede, horoz karısı, and papaz karısı. But there is still much research to be done in DNA fingerprinting and to determine who the ancestors are of the early domesticated grapevines of this part of the world that made their way across the Anatolian plain into Europe, over to the New World, and back again, and to determine what has happened to their progeny, to their children who ended up in the wine we drink today. If and when a final list of authentic Turkish varieties is finalized, I doubt if Turkish winemakers will or should stick to those native varieties to produce authentic heritage wines of Turkey. David Lowenthal, one of the great scholars of heritage, says about people that our heritage is really pretty mixed up. It's a mixed up business. And that, I quote him, we are all Creoles, unquote. In other words, depending on how far back you go in time, we all have lineages that are interwoven and crisscross the world. As research into the genetic variation of the contemporary Turkish population is also showing. Grapes and wine are a lot like people in that respect, as they cared little for national borders and were blended continually throughout history. Heritage and its different instruments can certainly help us to make us aware of past heritage and traditions in order to better preserve the tangible and intangible examples of it, including those botanical species that are threatened. But as we raise any glass of any wine, we must remember that ultimately we owe that toast to all our shared heritage and to our common ancestors. Thank you. Öncelikle bu güzel toplantı serisini düzenlediği için Yunan Konsolosluğu'na, Yunanistan Konsolosluğu'na sesim duyuluyor mu? Duyuluyor herhalde. Ee, ve yıllardır... First of all, I would like to thank to Greek Consulate for this organization. Maybe you have not heard for years, but we have collected some... Uh, archives from the Ottoman archives. I would like to thank to Gelia for inviting me here also. Actually, sometimes, you know, this is a hot topic. Sometimes we talk because Islam and wine relationships or wine bans, was wine free or not in Ottoman time, how it was solved or how important it was what how big how big it was as a problem we know there are some comments and interpretations about it maybe we can start from there maybe that's what i did that I, in my interpretation because actually i'm not a good wine talker i'm not a good candidate because i cannot drink uh, wine. I mostly drink Chipiro and uh, Raki because I have a sensitivity against wine. So, actually, my colleagues they know uh, in theory and she practices it also. But maybe I said, okay, if I cannot drink this drink, then I will research on it. In the law of Islam, Wine and anything which are intoxicating are banned. People think like this. And I'm talking about Islam. And in all the legislations, and 
they don't have a common uh, debate about it. They maybe we can call we can say in general. Of course, it's banned, but regarding this ban, there are some verses from the very first verse to the last one. I think there are five ones. And there are small differences, because there are some verses which is not directly banning, but starting with wine. And in a couple of steps, we see it is banning, actually. So these are uh, actually derived. Uh, these are actually sourcing from Teurat, but they are within they are not within the description of the bands because there are many bands under islam and uh, this is beyond the one under uh, the four main bands maybe i can give you four or five topics but i would like to give you an example because we don't have so much time do you know the drink called nepis it's called nepis it's not wine Nepis is like a liqueur. It's very strong, actually. It is very uh, high in terms of alcohol content. And it is made from grape or similar fruits. You make, you just keep it in within water for a couple of days. Of course, there is not a clear benchmark. Uh, you can drink cold or warm, but it is said you can drink it if it will not make you drunk. If you just stop before it will make you drunk. So this is very important because a guy called Asap, who was a very uh, respected person, Ibn Abbas says, the wife of the prophet uh, Muhammad, Aisha, she was drinking nebis every night, nebis that I was preparing two, three nights ago. So this is a debate. But it is a drink that you have to drink without it is getting too much alcohol content. So it is debatable. What is less, what is more? Because it is, it can change from person to person. Because if you wait a, a bit more, it can include more alcohol. Or, for example, you can be a person who would be drunk with just one beer also. So this topic in this term, there is not a common understanding on this topic. And because of this, because today uh, the scholars who are studying on Islam, they know Raki was kind of free. Some of them claim this. They say you can drink one glass if you are not hurting anybody, if you drink at home, if you don't behave bad to your children or so whatsoever without becoming drunk or without uh, making threatening the future of your family. You can drink and nobody will intervene with you. But of course, when you discuss with somebody who uh, who has faith, they don't accept this. Because these people are like trying to justify, maybe, like these people who say you can drink one glass of raki. So how was it in Ottoman time? Let, let me turn to that. We know in the first sources of Ottomans, there is a colleague from Ukraine, Alengo. It was mentioned by my colleague earlier. He was talking about the first activities of the sultans in one of his works. And there were too many references, like 70, 80 references, because he travels and then he says the sultan went on a trip and then he came back, he drank a bit, and then he went to a trip again. So there are like 70 references like this. And he's a bit like criticizing, for example, Yildirim Bayas, it was drinking a lot of wine. But all these topics, in it is just coming to a very sharp end around 1,517. As you may guess why, because in 1517, you can imagine, from Trabzon to Adana, 
make a line, a cross line, and imagine the the territory of Ottoman in the south and the east, because the number of uh, non-Muslim people is higher than Muslim people. So un up to 15, 17, they were not dealing with these non-Muslim groups. But when they had many more Muslim people after 15, 17, from Egypt and some scholars, uh, is scholars from Islam, they came they became a member of the Ottoman territory. Then they got affected, and some debates have arisen, and they were strong debates. They were debates, unique debates, actually. And they were trying to think, and they were a little bit dazed and confused uh, on how to find a way, because the population of uh, non-Muslims, Christians, Jews, the, the number was higher than the Muslims until that time. It was around 52, 48. But after 15, 17, uh, there was a balance, maybe we could say. So the Ottoman uh, em emperors had to thought, had to think what they will do because the Christians under their management, this is their sentence, by the way, they were free to produce the wine they needed for their uh, religious activities, because this was uh, really, this was permitted under law. But there were some terms and conditions. One of these terms is okay. It is said under the law that half of the population is free to drink wine. Of course, Muslims cannot drink wine, but non-Muslims can drink. But there were some terms. You, they will not sell to the Muslims. Mehanes, they will not be close to the mosque. Today, it's the same, actually. And inside neighborhoods, I mean, where uh, the number of uh, residents are high, there will be no tabernas. So there were like very certain and major rules, like maybe three, four rules. But besides these rules, there were not very strict uh, restrictions on wine production. But what we knew that time as mehane is not a mehane we know today, because not like it's not like a place you sit and you drink and you chat. They were used as a warehouse for wine. For example, you can think of Balkani, Unkapane, and Balkapane in Istanbul. These places were the same, and they were called Meyhane. And under Meyhane, for example, in Besiktas, there were some Meyhanes. Meyhane at the beginning. They didn't use mehane like we use today. It's not like a cafe, taberna, you sit and you chat. But from the early Ottoman chronicles we know, all Ottoman towns and cities, they had one mehane and one bozohane. We know from the history books. Since the very early periods, they had it. And these places are the places the producers were uh, the places the wine producers would deliver or receive the wine, and the non-Muslims would get wine or alcohol from these places, paying the tax. And there was a control. For example, ham means wine. Ham Mehane was a place uh, where there was a person assigned from the government working there to control, to check the wine sale. There are some cities uh, where there are no Mehane, I mean warehouses, Bayburt and Martin. There are too many Christians in both cities. So if you don't have Mehane, actually, this is when I have realized, because I thought these are just uh, residential places. But there was a rule that if you don't have Mehane, for example, in Bible and Martin Laws, if there was not Mehane, there would be a taxing like this. 
and it was said the villagers if they produce wine for their own need and consume it in within that village, they will not pay any tax. So there is this dimension also. And who else could consume wine? Tax capitulations, for example, in Izmir, Galata, there was Frank neighborhood in Izmir, Galata, and Iskenderia, or other harbor vill villages, towns, the residents at these towns, European merchants, consulates, general consulates. And they were free to consume the wine they brought with them, and they had to declare if they brought it from their countries, then they would not pay customs around Erdek, Yalova, surrounding of Istanbul, they could buy grape and they could again produce wine for their own need. So thinking within this frame, it's free. But of course, these are normative rules. So it's, a, it's like a thing which is a ban for half of the population and which is free for half of the population, which doesn't make any sense because, of course, there will be some illegal usage. Because there is a trade going on. Jewish people, they don't drink wine, but they are interested in the uh, trade, as you may guess. But the Muslims, they were caught drinking wine. Turks, they don't know how to drink, but they try to compete, let's say. Because in Tatavla, Beşiktaş, people sometimes they start to drink at uh, somebody's place. Uh, like eight, nine people start to drink, and then they discuss, and then they go to the court. And it is obvious they have drink. Uh, they have drinks, but there are many cases that they have not been brought to the court. So you can hope, you can think that there are almost a half more than the ones that have been reported. And these uh, small groups, which had eight, 10 participants, for example, they were getting the wine from the wine producers, or they could produce it, because it's not a difficult thing to produce wine at the end, and they were always getting caught. So thinking in this frame, who was intervening or who was uh, really dealing with this, um, let's say, so-called home drinking? I think it will be Murat II, because it's a political issue for him. It's political at the end. In 1553, uh, uh, his biggest uh, son killed his uh, brother, and there was a conflict and there were they, there were these love comedies and there were some reactions in Istanbul against this killing so the Sultan himself was in uh, Amasya for one and a half years and soon after there was another conflict among his children his other son was got killed so these are very like after one 1517 the uh, the amount of the, the number of the people who are Muslim got bigger and uh, this this conflicts or these killings within the uh, palace were affecting the pe were affecting people and in Aleppo and Damascus there were some other problems, and uh, these were heard from the people in Istanbul. And, and Mehan is turned into some other places, like uh, cafes now, like where people were getting kind of organized, or where people gathered and criticized the government. And that's why later on these places got banned because the government was being criticized there. So it was also a political ban. That's why I'm telling you this story. So it's not just a wine ban. It's also Mehane ban. And 
It's actually a coffee honey, like a coffee, coffee band. And because they don't want people to gather, considering these three, four factors, a very difficult process started. And from 1,515 tree to uh, the middle of the 17th century, there was a very strict ban. People were being caught with uh, one liter of uh, wine. They were, for example, wrapping the wine bottle on their belly in a very uh, deep uh, shawl. So people were not were finding many methods if they wanted to drink, and they were capable of drinking if they wanted to drink, and they learned these tricks very easily. When I uh, said, uh, uh, when I mentioned, uh, referred a drink called Nebis, when I first saw it, I didn't understand because I saw it in the uh, minutes in the records of the court. Everybody who got caught, they say, I drink Arab sherbet, not wine. It's Arab sherbet. What is this Arab sherbet? I didn't understand what is it, what it is. And there is Buspek. Uh, the uh, ambassador from, of Austrian uh, government, he says there is this ban, there is this very strict ban that it has been implied, and people claim they have drink, uh, they have, they had only Arab sherbet. And do you know what Arab sherbet means? Sherbet is a general name, but it's like a liqueur. You can call it like a liqueur, and it's the relative uh, freedom. Because even if they are caught with wine, they say, it is not wine, it is nebis, it's Arab sherbet. So they know the smallest details of the law. They want to take benefit out of it. They want to uh, trade it, trade wine. They want to drink wine. And we can clearly observe from that period that the Ottoman uh, population started to go out. And at the beginning of 17th century, there will be tobacco ban. And at the beginning of uh, 16th, even though the cafes and mehanes were banned, there was an illegal uh, continuity going on and a justification process starting. The ban in 1566, how long did it? OK. How, Am I keeping up with time? 10, 15 minutes? The ban in 1566, Selim the second, was uh, abolished. Uh, it, at his period, it was abolished. And so this was not a, in, this created an inconsistency in implication of the or enforcement of this ban because people was confused. People are confused. Uh, Joseph Nasi, he was saying he was getting a privilege for a foreign trade of Ottoman wine. You know Naxos? Naxos, the island. You, you are teach, trying to teach me Greek? At one time, he was sending 10,000 barrels. So I'm talking of big amounts, big quantities. So it was not feasible for them to make this ban. This harm uh, security I mentioned, Ahmed I, he was a child uh, sultan. Okay, he's a Muslim emperor. He want, he cannot construct mosque, for example, getting tax from wine. So he banned it. Do you know the quantity that time? Because it, there were too many bans. And it was around 11.7 million akçe. And it's big money. It's including like Anadolu Beyler Bey, which includes 17 um, uh, town uh, administration. Imagine that, or imagine Rumeli Beyler Begi. Annual revenue was 1 million akçe, and Rumeli Beyler Begi had 900 uh, akçe. And I'm saying you 11 million, 3 million akçe, which is big money, and they couldn't risk this money. So we don't see these strict bans afterwards. 
So there is, this is another context actually, which is transformation. And Osman II wanted to do this, and uh, Murat IV wanted to do this, but keeping it free only for non-Muslims, it was not very practical because historians they look at these uh, statements of bans. They said it is always used uh, passive language. It's like it was banned. And while the statement or the law uh, code is uh, issued, they use this language. In their world, which is a pre-modern uh, government, they are rash rational and their uh, understanding was like this because it's a Muslim uh, government and they need to pay care they need to take care or pay attention to Sharia and they also need to keep up uh, or they also need to continue the current order Osman the second uh, or young Osman he was very uh, religious. He was more religious than his brother. While he was killing his uh, brother, the, uh, for example, the Janissary says, he was just saying to his brother, you were going to close down the Mehanes, uh, so now you get your payoff. So, there was a, a, an opposition also. These new public uh, locations, mehanes and cafes, they also tell us something else. They tell the Muslim community, which were not going out after the last prey of the day, they started to go out. They started to have time out. They started to be more social. So this was a transformation. And that's why there were very severe bans. And between 15,050 to 16,050s, there was uh, this very strict bans. But Ottoman population was transformed, and the socializing process was impeded and the revolutionary uh, impacts were started to be seen. I think these are important, like tobacco, grape, wine, rocky, or similar products. They affected the life in cities. Imagine a Muslim person. They were only going to mosque to pray or take care to pray. They were not going out otherwise. If they go, they will either kill somebody or they will do something bad. This is also similar for the Christians or Jewish people because nightlife, it, was, it had very strict limits. Therefore, besides this, of course, people who were going to Mehane, they were in a new uh, trend, they were very unusual, and they were perceived so. There are some concepts in Ottoman language called bid'at, which means uh, which means like a late. Uh, late deformation, which is not coming from the past, but it's a late deformation and it has to be removed, so to preserve the community, the society. That's why going to Mehane or a cafe or Bozane, uh, uh, drinking bitter Boza, not the, uh, not the sweet one, was banned also. And they were trying to do this because of political reasons or because of being a Muslim emperor. And how far they could go. You see, even at the time of Selim the Turk, there are some bands, but also there are some counting of Mehanes. And there was 400 Mehanes only in Istanbul. 
you go and you just have like some uh, just some small glasses of drinks. For example, in Üsküdar Kumcular Sokak, there are there were three hundred Üsküdar. Imagine they drink. Izmir. Everybody was thinking that they, you can dr drink at Frank neighborhood, but uh, Cordon. But actually, you drink at Tilkilik neighborhood, and it's very high. And they also have Koltuk Meyhane, which like like this stand up uh, pubs, maybe uh, that you can just drink and go. I'm talking about 16th, 17th century, so. Because of various reasons, Ottoman uh, uh, government was sometimes strict following this, sometimes was more casual about it. So they had the, they were writing in Arabic, by the way. They say, the mother of all the evil is wine. They say they want to ban it, they want to break the glasses, but the next day you see, not there, but somewhere else, there is a new Mehani opened. So this is like an adventure going on like this, and the uh, number of Mehanes and Kaviani and the nightlife got more popular, and then a social transformation happened. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for this very interesting speech and especially this uh, for this wine. And I hope you also do a research for the Mehanis in the 19th century. Now, if you have any questions. Merhaba. Ben özellikle şeyi sormak istiyorum. İkinci Abdülhamid'in e I'd like to ask Abdülhamid the second. What were his uh, actions? Actually, there were not many violations during his time and opening Mehanes and Kabeanes. Uh, they were trying to close, there, there was not an approach to uh, prevent the new ones opening or to close down the uh, already existing ones. The Ottomans, they were able to manage or uh, administrate this very well because we should remember these public places, they were also places that people could spend time and spend their leisure time because the revel, revel uh, the resistance starts there, the protests start there also. And also, on the other hand, this can keep people busy. During the time of Hamid and Abdulaziz, they were really special to watch, to observe, the kahvehanes were open. I read that even two or three people came together. It was a reason to write the journal, but how it happened that he left them uh, open, because he was observing at the beginning of Ottoman at the beginning of that uh, period. Ejo Ibrahim says, going to Mehane is uh, more important than going to Chaihane because we are talking about uh, uh, drinks other than chai, uh, which makes you drunk, and you hurt yourself. And they realized it. We had stadiums, 
we have stadiums today, but that time there were only Mehanes and these places. Pardon? Ah, she's Vardenus. Kusura bakma, görmedim. I don't see you. Uh, the speaker cannot be heard. We need to verify. These are also social places. Bozahanes, Kahvehanes, Mehanes. Because we see that they are also present at the uh, lojas, this is VIP places uh, during banquets or festivals. And only the shop owner of the Mehane, they could, uh, they could promote or they could show, display their products. And the traditions and the customs in Ottoman, um, we see in a book that Mehanes were very organized places and production. Maybe it was not complying with the terms of Islam, but we see that uh, Mehanes are present. This Things happened after this, after the transformation I referred, because before 1550s, you don't see that this shop owner displays. What you refer is like the circumcision festivals. This is after this change, but not before, after this transformation. I mean, before that uh, time, you cannot find a scene like that. For example, show me one in 1484. It's a big discovery. It would be a big discovery. Thank you for your uh, comment. I don't remember the source, but I remember uh, it was said the glasses of the Mehanes they should not let uh, they should not be visible from outside because people passing by they should not see what's happening inside. Is it a right information? I don't know. I didn't run into something like that. But they, of course, they are hidden places. You cannot see their doors or their glasses. For example, in 1520s, if you look for a mehane, you cannot find it. Only the uh, regular gourds, they will know it. But later on, it depends from places to places. For example, Bursa mehanes, they are very uh, magnificent and very elegant. And the waitresses and the staff and the photos on the walls or the uh, uh, or the decoration embroideries on the glass windows, they are very elaborate and, but you may have a point, of course, I don't know, I didn't read it. The speaker is not talking to the microphone. It's another topic, it's very interesting, so I did don't want to mention it. Lucy knows, Miss, Miss Lucy knows also. It's a legal place. You may all have Boza maybe, yeah? Boza, if you keep it a bit, it gets uh, alcohol content also. And we know it turns into alcohol very easily. It's, we have it today. It's something like malt, like beer. And the bitter Boza was also not legal. Yeah, it's called also like sharp boza, keskin boza. But bozaine was legal, so they were able to sell wines, let's say, under the stall. Hepinize iyi akşamlar.
I would like to thank the Greek Consulate and the staff of the Greek Consulate because for the last couple of years they made great investments in education, culture, they made a big reform and they are giving these opportunities for us. Thank you very much for this. We are thankful. And we also would like to thank you because this is Saturday and I had five other invitations because there are many openings at art galleries. All my friends, they went there, but you are here. Thank you very much for your presence also because you show interest. Thank you very much. I took some notes. I'm from Greece myself because of my parents. I won't expect to hear here. First of all, our uh, academic researcher, she was very superficial. On her map, European map, she showed the root of wine. She skipped but not only Turkey, but also Bulgaria. But Bulgaria, they have a good wine scene. So I would expect, I expect it. In Turkey, Tenados, Bozcada, Imros, Gökçada. I will not list all of them, you all know. There are some places with Turkish and Greek uh, characteristics, and these are special places. They still continue, for example, in Barbo Yorgo. Every year they have wine festivals, and she didn't mention this. And I expected something more. For example, you are making a research. There are too many topics, and this is about religion and education because. Uh, Islam has a big, uh, cult, a big point also here. When Turkish Republic was founded, Atatürk became monopole. Atatürk established monopole, uh, Tekel. And if you look at the history of Tekel, um, it is one of the biggest industries which was reverted gold and silver around the world. Çok sevdiğimiz, bildiğimiz çocukluğumuz da bilmiyorum yaşlı ileride. Mesela bir Papadopoulos şarapları vardı. Hala var herhalde. Hala var mı bilmiyorum. Ama Do you remember Papadopoulos wines? You didn't mention also. In Turkey, Konya, for example, they are very conservative cities, but also the, the amount of alcohol, the highest amount of alcohol consumed is also from Konya. So this is like an irony. But I also expected another topic. In wine producing in Greece and Turkey, in Europe, for example, Sibagegi company, there are some uh, white dust called enzymes in, in uh, ten, tins. And Tekel never used it. And in Romania, it was not used. Chankaya, it, was, it didn't use. They, they didn't use enzymes because they wanted to produce wine with, without using enzymes. And you take a big barrel and you add water and then you add a bit of that dust and you keep it and the fermentation gets strong and then you get double amount of wine and in terms of trade it's perfect of course it causes uh, ulceria and there is something else şarabın içine bakır lehva koyuyorlar place copper plate inside wine and they give electricity just one time they give and it uh, the wine gets electrolyzed and the fermentation stops all of a sudden
then it gets a flavor like as if it's a very old wine. This was also banned. I would like to say I come to the beginning. For example, Italy has very cheap wines. Even French people, they import wine illegally, although they don't have customs. Uh, they just try to get wine from Italy to sell in France. This happened in Turkey too. In the States, uh, they bought uh, Balneba wines. It was import. It was exported from Turkey, and it was sold as if uh, an American wine. Thank you very much, especially to Greek consulate for this nice talks. And I do hope next time you would mention Tenedos Imros. Uh, I just, it's a request of mine. Thank you very much. Good evening. Any more question? Yeah. We can know. Thank you very much. Your presence.